Last year, over 45,000 people made the unsafe, unnecessary and illegal journey across the Channel. Our asylum system has been overwhelmed. We're now spending almost £7 million a day on hotels. Stopping the boats is one of the five promises the Prime Minister has made to the British people and it's my top priority. That's why today I'm announcing a new illegal migration bill to do exactly that. The Prime Minister and I have been working flat out for months to bring this legislation to Parliament. This bill will mean that if you come here illegally, you will not be able to stay. You will be detained and removed to your home country if safe, or a safe third country like Rwanda. We are committed to helping those in need, like the hundreds of thousands of people we have supported from Ukraine, Afghanistan, and Hong Kong in recent years. But it's not fair that people who travel through a string of safe countries and then come to the UK illegally can jump the queue and game our system. This bill will bring an end to that. Enough is enough. We must stop the boats. Breaking news, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is being invaded. They're under attack. The country is being overwhelmed. This is some of the language being used by Suella Braverman, the Home Secretary of the UK, to describe human beings desperately trying to claim asylum. This rhetoric has already led to 15 people being arrested with hammers and fireworks in violent scenes outside a hotel housing asylum seekers and a man throwing petrol bombs at a migrant processing centre in Dover. There's a bit to unpack here, so let's get into it. First up, let's take a look at the numbers. In 2022, 45,746 men, women and children risked their lives to cross the English Channel from France. Roughly a football stadium of people. Some might say, well, you know, that is just too many for a small country like the UK to handle. Fair enough? No, not really. Why? Because twice that number of British nationals decided to uproot and leave in the same year. If you include non-British nationals, the number of people who had enough of Brexit Britain in 2022, the number rises to 560,000. Even when you take into account all types of uh, migration, which is still rising in the UK, the long-term trend is that since 2009, net change in migration into the UK has been going down year on year. To lessen the outlandish hysteria even further, the natural UK population is projected to start declining by 2025, and by the end of the decade, Britain will be reliant on migrant workers to increase the working age population. If this doesn't happen, Brits might struggle to collect their pensions, like is happening in Japan. In two years' time, Brits might be thankful to the Albanians willing to risk their lives to come and work in the country. It sure beats chartering flights and paying people to come and harvest fruit and vegetables. So, is the UK being invaded? Is it under attack? Is it being overwhelmed? It doesn't seem like it. So, why would the Conservative government and the billionaire-owned right-wing media use these terms that Gary Lineker recently likened to the rhetoric of Nazi Germany. That's what this video is about, and we will get into that in a bit. But first, let's take a look at the reality of the Conservative Party's new bill. They are basically trying to pass legislation that would mean any refugees who succeed in crossing the Channel would be sent back to their countries as soon as they land, or, for reasons unexplained, be flown to Rwanda in Central Africa. Why not? You know, because let's face it, Rwanda is in a much better financial situation to care for refugees than Great Britain. That's because the UK taxpayer will be paying Rwanda £30,000 for each human being they accept. So, £150,000 for a family of five. As a side note, you could build a couple of decent houses for that money and it would provide jobs and boost the British economy. So, a lot of people like to say that they don't mind people coming legally. It's the illegal immigrants they mind. 
Now, let's discuss this term the Tories like to throw around. Illegal immigrants. Ooh, it sounds scary. So, why are they illegal? Well, to apply for asylum to the UK, you have to be inside the UK. To enter the UK, you have to have a valid visa. If you aren't fortunate to have been born in a rich country, the chances are you will not get a visa. Can you see the catch-22 refugees find themselves in here? You can't apply for asylum outside the UK and can't get a visa to enter the UK to claim asylum. And this is intentional. Braverman says we must stop the boats. Well, we could do that tomorrow. France has been urging the Conservative government to open an asylum centre in Calais for that very reason, to stop the boats. More importantly, to save lives. So, if Braverman wants to stop the boats, and France is offering to do just that, why do they refuse to stop the boats by opening an asylum centre in France? The honest answer is that the majority of people who are crossing the channel are not illegal immigrants. They are refugees, just like Ukrainians who are granted visas. They just ain't white. Of the 45,746 human beings who claimed asylum after crossing the channel to the UK in 2022, six out of 10 were successful in being granted asylum as refugees. 40% of those risking their lives to cross the channel are from just five countries, Afghanistan, Iran, Syria, Eritrea, and Sudan. These countries, just like Ukraine, are extremely dangerous for very reasons. The single thing illegal about this is the legislation itself. The clue is in the name, the Illegal Migration Bill. The UK signed up to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, after the horrors of World War II. Under the declaration, anyone is able to apply for asylum anywhere. Yet. The new Tory legislation insists people are disqualified if they don't apply in the first country possible. That's quite handy, with Britain being an island at the western edge of Europe. Another common complaint seems to be, why are they all coming to the UK? This is an easy one to answer. They aren't. Take a look at the countries hosting the highest number of refugees. The UK are not on this list. When it comes to asylum claims, the UK is also way down the list. Again, certain media outlets owned by very rich, white, old men are feeding this hysteria, as are the Conservative Party, for reasons we'll get into later. A lot of people also like to say that they don't mind people escaping war. It's the economic migrants they have a problem with. So, this is what the rest of this video is going to be about. Why do many of our fellow human beings feel the need to leave their home countries in search of a better life and risk that life crossing the Mediterranean or the English Channel? Trigger warning. Any snowflakes uninterested in cold hard facts should probably switch off now and go and watch a Piers Morgan video instead. So I was born in 1977 and since I was a child, like you, I have been led to believe that there is a one-way street of aid pouring from the rich countries of the global north to those in the global south. I was brought up on live aid and comic relief. But is this really true? Some interesting figures come in your way. Rich nations give around $186 billion in aid each year. Yippee! If we look purely at this figure, it is easy for us to close our eyes and feel a warm glow. In reality, however, this figure represents just one side of a very unequal exchange. In research published in 2016 by the US-based Global Financial Integrity and the Center for Applied Research at the Norwegian School of Economics, it was found that in 2012, developing nations received $1.3 trillion in aid, investment and income from abroad. So far, so good. But what they also identified was that flowing in the other direction was $3.3 trillion in debt repayments, foreign profits made on investments that are sent to home countries, and trade misinvoicing. This is the practice of reporting false prices on invoices and then sending the disparity directly to tax havens. 
in essence, it is the poor countries that are providing aid to the rich countries. It is estimated that $16.3 trillion has been drained from, drained from the global south in this way since 1980. In total, the research suggests that for every $1 of aid provided by rich nations, they extract $24. This is the poverty trap that poorer nations find themselves in. Multinational financial institutions and corporations benefit from this cozy arrangement, as do consumers like me in the global north, at the expense of citizens of the global south. It's not just people in the global north that benefit from the theft of the global south. There are also winners in the developing nations, although they are essentially playing for the other team in the global north. In what is called the resource curse, it has been found that the nations with the most resources are often home to the poorest people. It is estimated that 69% of people in extreme poverty are living in countries where oil, gas and minerals are a key part of the economy. For example, in Nigeria and Angola, which are respectively the largest and second largest oil and gas producers in Africa. 68% of Nigerians live on less than a dollar and 25 cents a day. 48% of Angolans live on less than a dollar and 90 cents a day. How can this be? Well, a nice little arrangement called economic rent is partly to blame. Poorer nations usually provide licenses to foreign companies to extract their resources and then they are paid in dollars. As this money is essentially unearned, it provides a bag of riches for the ruling class who have no need to tax the people to fund their operations. This means they don't need the approval of the people anymore and then can act in their own interests. Education spending then declines, but military spending increases so they can protect the elite who often rule for many years as there is no incentive to leave office. Of course, foreign banking interests are all too happy to assist these kleptocrats in transferring this unearned money to safe foreign tax havens while the people remain poor. Africa is home to 165,000 extremely wealthy Africans who hold a combined $860 billion. Our economies in the global north are literally fueled by resources from the south. For example, France, 75% of whose energy requirement is met by nuclear fuel, relies heavily on Niger for uranium. For every woman that dies in childbirth in France, 55 will die in Niger. Another example is the smartphone industry. In Finland and South Korea, the homes of Nokia and Samsung, the average life expectancy is 82 and 83, respectively. But in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where the minerals used to make the phones are extracted, people rarely make it past 60. To make up for a short work life, it's okay, children start working from the age of 7. 60% of the planet's cobalt is mined here, largely unregulated, with kids working in tunnels liable to collapse and breathing cobalt dust deep into their lungs as protective equipment is deemed unnecessary. The waste from these mines seeps into the river systems and contaminates the drinking water. In the rich north, we could, of course, pay more at the cash register to provide adequate wages and protective equipment, but then we would have less money to waste on stuff that we don't need, and the mirage of our lives improving would disappear, and with it, the dream we have been fed since we were born that if we just keep spending to keep the giant machine ticking over, everything will slowly but surely get better and better for everyone. Just don't stop buying things, whatever you do. In Africa, at least 20 countries depend on resource extraction for 25% or more of their exports. In total, 66% of Africa's exports are resource-based. Whereas the figures in Europe, the US and Latin America are 11%, 15% and 42% respectively. In Nigeria, oil and gas exports account for a whopping 97% of total exports. In Angola, 98% of export revenue comes from oil and gas, with the remainder coming from diamonds. The climate emergency is exacerbating the situation. 34 low-income countries that are already spending a total of $5.4 billion a year on adjusting to the impacts of climate change 
are simultaneously paying $29.4 billion on annual debt repayments to the Global North. To rub salt into the already painful wounds, much of this debt was accrued during European colonization. Can anyone imagine how this would feel? Africa is not inherently poor. It is poor because of the systematic looting of its resources, which has been going on for hundreds of years. It is not the global north propping up Africa, but the other way around. So we can see why many people need to escape this grinding poverty. Surrounded by agic poverty, with billions of dollars of unearned wealth, it is essential that African kleptocrats have somewhere safe to hide their unjustified bonanza. Fortunately, such places exist and are known as tax havens. They sound lovely. As income inequality grew exponentially in the 1920s, the rich started looking for places to hoard their wealth safely away from the people who made them rich. Starting in Switzerland and Liechtenstein, tax havens spread to Jersey, Bermuda, the Bahamas, Panama, the Cayman Islands, and the American state of Delaware, to name but a few. Under the pretense of keeping their money safe from government expropriation, it is estimated that $500 billion, 30% of Africa's wealth, itself expropriated from the people, is now sitting in various safe havens around the world. And this figure is rising by up to $100 billion each year. This dirty money is joined by notes belonging to the soccer superstar Lionel Messi, Donald Trump's Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross, Russian President Vladimir Putin, the King of Saudi Arabia, the President of the United Arab Emirates, the former Emir of Qatar, and former leaders of Ecuador, Australia, Pakistan, Jordan, Moldova, Ukraine, Georgia, and Iceland. Despite his France first policies, Jean-Marie Le Pen, former leader of the far right party, Front National, has most of his wealth stored in tax havens. What a guy. The eldest daughter of former Philippine president, Ferdinand Marcos, one of the world's richest thieves, also takes advantage of these secrecy jurisdictions. Perhaps no uh, surprise there. The list is fairly exhaustive and is a who's who of rich politicians, socialites, business people, royalty, and athletes. It also included the late Queen Elizabeth II, who had $13 million invested in the Cayman Islands and Bermuda. When the Panama Papers were released to media organizations in 2016, then British Prime Minister David Cameron promised to sweep away tax secrecy. It is of little surprise that little has changed, as his own father was found to be managing a multi-million pound investment fund in the Bahamas that helped many rich citizens avoid paying any tax. When asked whether the Cameron family still had money invested in the fund, the Prime Minister's spokesman said, that is a private matter. Interestingly, the US Federal Trade Commission disagrees, as they state on their website that free and open markets are the foundation of a vibrant economy. Clearly, there is nothing open about tax havens. It is estimated that governments lose between $500 and $600 billion a year in tax revenue, with around $200 billion being lost in low-income countries. American Fortune 500 companies have stashed approximately $2.6 trillion offshore, and they have been joined by individuals whose tax haven holdings amount to $8.7 trillion. The total amount of money being hidden from the tax authorities in these tax havens is estimated at $36 trillion. It is projected that decarbonizing the economy will cost around $3.5 trillion per year. So there is enough money sitting offshore to fund this transition for a decade without the average taxpayer paying anything. Additionally, according to the American economist Jeffrey Sachs, it would cost $3.5 trillion to completely end poverty. Completely. The money in tax havens could do this 10 times over. If we did this, it would be much less likely that people would migrate at all. If you are wondering about government duplicity in the existence of tax havens, perhaps this will clear things up. Some of the largest accountancy firms in the world, including Deloitte, Ernst & Young, KPMG and PricewaterhouseCoopers, were helping the UK Treasury to draft financial legislation and then helping their rich clients to evade their tax responsibilities to the UK. They were even found to be advising their clients to adopt 
tax schemes that had only a 25% chance of courts judging them to be legal. There is a revolving door between the Treasury and the big four accountancy firms, and these firms profit to the tune of $2 billion a year, all at the expense of the British public, who lose much needed billions in funding for schools, hospitals, and infrastructure. People argue that there just aren't enough homes for refugees, but they fail to see why. The UK needs to build around 4 million new properties, and according to Leeds Building Society, there are 676,452 homes sitting empty right now. That could really make a dent. The real reason there is a lack of housing in the UK, though, is due to the right to buy scheme starting in the 1980s. Until Thatcher flogged the lot to raise a little bit of money, local councils could use their rent income to build new homes. Once they'd been sold off to the more prosperous council tenants, there was no more income, and new builds slowly disappeared over the rest of the Conservative reign. Successive governments, Labour and Conservative, have failed to build affordable homes, and now people are stuck paying exorbitant rents for under-maintained properties while private landlords bank the profits. Jeremy Corbyn was planning on building 150,000 affordable homes a year, but Rupert Murdoch and the other billionaire media oligarchs had other plans. That's for another video, though. Likewise, the NHS isn't struggling because of immigration. It's struggling because it's being intentionally starved of investment. Remember the £350 million a day it was going to get after Brexit? That didn't happen, did it? No. And again, this is intentional. It's the last piece in the privatisation jigsaw. Starve it of investment, and then the public will be open to it being sold off to American healthcare providers. ka -ching! It's all about profit. The money is there. Just look at the staggering £37 billion spent on COVID-19 test and tracing. It didn't even work. During the pandemic, as everyone was socially distancing, the government spent their time searching for the magic money tree. Huh? And uh, they've been saying it doesn't exist, but they found it just in time. And fortunately, the magic money tree had £376 billion notes dangling from its glorious branches. The tree exists. The money is there. So, back to the lovely sounding tax havens. While many argue that they are necessary to protect individual wealth from overzealous governments, this is not a view shared by 300 economists who wrote the following in 2016. The existence of tax havens does not add to overall global wealth or well-being. They serve no useful economic purpose. While these jurisdictions undoubtedly benefit some rich individuals and multinational corporations, this benefit is at the expense of others, and they therefore serve to increase inequality. As tax revenue for public investment is lost to tax havens, infrastructure and services deteriorate, while private companies rub their hands with glee as they wait in the wings to offer their inferior services at increased cost. In the past 40 years, there has been a massive transfer of assets from the people to the private sector. And again, this benefits the billionaire class at the expense of society. This is why the Conservative Party in the UK, the Republican Party in the USA, and neoliberal governments all around the world focus on immigration. It deflects attention away from the true crimes that are being perpetuated. The true crime that is the rich are stripping assets from the people. The true crime is that the fossil fuel industry is leading us ever closer to climate breakdown. And we, the people, are subsidizing them to do it. The true crime is that animal agriculture is destroying our incredible planet. The true crime is that we, the people, are funding wars which only benefit the rich. We send our sons and daughters to fight in foreign lands so that arms manufacturers can literally make a killing and then corporations like Halliburton can make billions from reconstructing what the military arm of corporations destroyed. Unfortunately, things are about to become much, much worse. Due to the climate crisis, things will soon become unmanageable without radical changes. There are expected to be 1.2 billion humans seeking refuge globally by 2050. 
The number was 30 million last year. Can anyone fathom what it would look like to have a population similar to China's on the move at the same time? Ironically, the same people burning police vans in protest at asylum seekers are often the same people who oppose climate action. You couldn't make this up. So, instead of getting angry about desperate refugees, it might be better to direct that anger at our elected officials who are dogmatically propping up the system that creates these conditions people are desperately trying to escape from. It might be better to get angry at the corporations and billionaires that are causing the sixth extinction that will likely include us. Yes, we all have the right to be angry, everybody, but that anger has to be directed at those with power, not at those who are powerless. So if you are frightened about immigration today, maybe you should join Extinction Rebellion outside Parliament on April the 21st, because without urgent action to reduce CO2 emissions, the number of desperate humans crossing borders tomorrow will be incomprehensible. If you like this video, click the like button, click subscribe, and share on social media. Thanks for watching.